Well, since you ended with uh, the election of Donald Trump, I feel free to start with it. Uh -oh. Although I know you hate to talk about him because <laughs> we just we've been discussing this over dinner. Um, are you sorry that you couldn't watch the impeach impeachment hearings tonight? The the the, the witnesses of uh, witnessing of uh, Gordon Sondland. I'd rather be in Amsterdam. <laughs> we've got television here. <laughs> Yeah, but why go to Amsterdam to watch TV when you can look at Amsterdam? Yeah. I mean, I'll watch it. Everything is preserved now. But um, I think part of the struggle of the Trump era is to live your life without having it completely occupied by a man who fills me with entirely negative feelings. So sometimes I have to push it away without completely walking away from it. <clears throat> Okay. But yeah, I'll watch them because I, I know today was, yeah, was crucial. And, and, and uh, I, I also ask it for another reason, because is there, is there a connection to the, the, the topic we'll, we will discuss tonight? You say the book is not about foreign policy, but it is about America's place and role in the world. Sure. Um, is what we're seeing in, in the Ukraine saga, or whatever you want to call it, is it a, a, a logical consequence of the development you describe in the book from an America that, with, with all its faults and blunders <clears throat> and double ambitions, tried to make the world a better place, or thought it was trying to make the world a better place, to an America that not only understands the limitations of its powers, but also seems to have lost the will to be an example? the generation after World War II create NATO and the UN and the structures of international liberal order, that was his world. Mm -hmm. And he was entirely a creature of it. So today he would not know what to think of Donald Trump. It would all seem perverse to him. But what he might <clears throat> have missed was how l little credibility elites like him had by the time of his death. The Iraq War, the war in Afghanistan, the financial crisis, the Great Recession, failure after failure of the political class. As I say in the book, <clears throat> that class sent other people's sons and daughters to fight and die while they found ways to get rich. And I think there's only so much of that that can go on mm -hmm. while we have this tremendous economic inequality, this hollowing out of the middle class before a lot of Americans say, why the hell should we believe you? Why should we follow you? Why do we need to be leaders? What's in it for me and my children? And that was the blasted landscape that Donald Trump walked onto in 2016. And that he understood. <clears throat> he understood. He spoke for it, which most elites did not know at the time. They didn't understand why Trump had this, this power. They thought of him as a fool. Did you? Because, because uh, the unwinding uh, appeared in 2013, which was three years before Donald Trump. Um, did you see him coming? I think I did. Uh, the unwinding doesn't mention him, but it kind of predicts him. I was sitting at dinner with Angela Merkel and a bunch of foreign policy heavyweights, including Henry Kissinger one night and Dr. Ruth. Um, who, who really put Henry Kissinger in his place on the subject of refugees. Um, and all these foreign policy mandarins were telling Chancellor Merkel, this was September 2015, ah, Trump, he'll be done in a month or two. It'll be Jeb Bush or someone else. And I, I'm not trying to sound prophetic. I said to Merkel, do not underestimate him. He is connected to something in the country that's real and, and that's powerful. I thought she, that Hillary Clinton would win. The polls showed her ahead. The polls are pretty accurate. She lost by that much in the Electoral College in a few states. It could have easily gone the other way. But I never underestimated Trump as a voice of a certain discontent and alienation that is very strong in our country and in a lot of European countries too. So uh, I, I want to try to find out in, in, in the next 30 minutes or so how, how this came to be, how this landscape that, that Trump walked into and successfully exploited um, 
came to be, as, as you try to understand in your book, through the life of Richard Holbrook. But first, on the book, uh, the first sentence is, did I know him? And you just explains that the I is not you, maybe no. a little bit of you, but did you know him? I did know him, but not well, and not nearly as well as this narrator. Um, the narrator seems to have been even in bed with him like, sometimes. There is a scene in which we walk through an open door into a bedroom, and it's done tactfully, I think, but it may be one of the few sex scenes in all of the biographies of statesmen. Um, <clears throat> I knew him as a journalist. He courted me the way he courted um, a lot of journalists. Starting out with David Halberstam. In, David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan, the great reporters of the Vietnam War, uh, Christian Amanpour and others, and me. Um, I wrote about him in The New Yorker when he was at Afghanistan envoy. I didn't understand how unpopular he had made himself with the White House, so it was not a great piece of reporting. but. That piece probably gave Kati Martin, his widow, the confidence to give me all those filing cabinets, which she did not open. She didn't, had no idea what was in them. She just said, take them. So I put them in a moving van, and they crossed the Brooklyn Bridge. Why did you take them? Honestly, I don't know. <clears throat> It's one of those things, you know, writers sometimes, and people, take turns in life that they can't quite explain. I, I guess the best I can say is, I did find him deeply interesting. Did you like him? Not completely, <clears throat> but like and dislike were too small to capture his effect on you. Because what he would do was just take you over and own you. So when I wrote that piece for The New Yorker, during the fact checking, he began to find out what was in the piece. And I was sitting in a lecture with my phone on vibrate, and it began to vibrate like crazy. And it was Holbrook calling me, basically to tell me I was going to destroy his career and to try to edit the piece for me, and even to tell me what the lead should be and this and that. He just took you over. <clears throat> and you couldn't, there was something irresistible about him. I think even Obama felt that irresistibility, although he did resist it. So that was part of it. I'm also just obsessed with American history. That's my subject, American life. And I didn't see it at the time, but I began, as I wrote, to realize I was telling a story that was not the story of one man. It was the story of an era, <clears throat> and that But era... That only occurred to you working right. on the book. I didn't see it at first. But the real reason was they were there. The papers were there, and someone else would get them if I didn't. And this is a rare chance, a totally raw, unvetted archive full of God knows what. The, just the mystery of it was attractive to me. What am I going to find in there? And I found all kinds of stuff that was surprising. So once I began reading his letters and listening to his diaries, and I didn't regret it. I felt, okay, that was the right thing to do. I still didn't know how to write it. No. And that answer came, as I said, literally as I was driving and heard this voice that seemed like the first ray of light in this, you know, long, dark hall of a biography that hadn't really inspired me until then. And, and <clears throat> when and how, I mean, you, you just said that, that you only realized that this, well, this was about the end of an era in 2016, in the summer of 2016. <clears throat> Um, but when and how did you realize that uh, Richard Holbrook was, so to speak, the, <coughs> uncle, the uncle Sam of, of the last half century? I mean, and, and was he? This, mm. this dichotomy that you describe, his, his monstrous selfishness, as you just said, and his idealism, and also his, his blindness for his own ambitions, his, his lack of self-reflection. Yes. How, much, how much are they characteristics of Uncle Sam? I mean, doesn't the question answer itself? <laughs> Aren't we famously self-confident, blind to our faults, convinced of our goodness, aggressive in our action, um, impatient with the long term or with 
quiet, steady engagement. Instead, we want to move in and fix it and then move on. I mean, that is our character. Um, there's something a bit manic depressive in our character. We're either pouring effort into a war in Iraq that is astounding and horrifying to the world, or we're saying the hell with it, let's get out. Um, you could make a case that Richard Holbrook was not the figure of the American century. He, he wasn't. I mean, what, what did he do? He ended the war in Bosnia. As UN ambassador, <clears throat> he achieved one very amazing goal, which was to get the United States to pay the billion dollars it owed the UN and avoid being expelled. We were about to be expelled from the UN, and Holbrook is the one who negotiated with both every UN ambassador in New York and every Republican in Congress to come to an arrangement where we would pay the dues we owed that Congress was holding up. So that's like two paragraphs in the book, but it's a huge achievement. But still, I know that Holbrook is not at the top, and that's fine because great man biographies are often there's something false about them or something expected and unsurprising we know that story this is a story of someone who you don't want to read about because of his long list of achievements but because of the the story and the constant action and the character being revealed through that action for me that's what i want to write a book about not dutifully build a monument to someone just because he has a great cv and you also said, uh, or, or yeah, you, you do say it in, in the first chapter of the book, which you just partly read, that by following such a person, you learn much more about the power structures. Uh, I think in, in the days of these hearings, we would call them interagency processes. Yeah. Um, or lack of process. <laughs> yeah. uh, why, why do we learn more? Because it isn't veiled by retelling and by careful guarded shaping of the story which presidents are doing all the time, the people around them are doing it. It's as if you can't quite get into the inner sanctum because it's too secret. Holbrook, it's naked. There's nothing hidden. His insecurities are naked, his ambitions, his appetites, and so are his rivalries and his hatreds. His Bosnia diary is full of a kind of pathological uh, uh, rivalry with Anthony Lake, who is his best friend in Vietnam. They were the stars of the next generation of diplomats. They were going to be the next George Kennan. And then they had a falling out over something about as personal as it can get. And I'm not going to say more because I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read the book. And by the time of Bosnia, when Lake was Clinton's national security advisor and Holbrook was assistant secretary of state for Europe, they hated each other. And that hatred came into the meetings and filled the air and actually got in the way of making a coherent policy on Bosnia. It's human. It's not just position papers and interagency meetings. It's human conflict, ambition, and something about foreign policy where because we know so little about the world, to be honest, Holbrook once said we sometimes have 2% of the information we need to make a decision. The rest is character and judgment. And so you, it's like it's a bit of a Shakespearean drama where you're watching people trying to make decisions of the grandest consequences like whether to intervene in Bosnia and it sometimes comes down to some petty bitter relationship between two men. To me, that's more interesting than thinking it's all happening at this abstract level of grand strategy and ideas. On, on the other hand, I mean, it does, even, even if it's, if it's uh, construed by these ambitions and these character, it does form a pattern in the end, and, and the, the American century <clears throat> was a pattern of American uh, influence in, in the world, as you describe in the book. So I'd like to, to try to, to break it down. I mean, you, you, it took you 624 pages, so... We can do it. We Let's can do, do it. it in 15 minutes, I guess. Um, but through, through the career of Richard Holbrook, he started out in Vietnam. You just told us and you showed us. Um, what were his ambitions there, and, and what does that tell us about... American foreign policy at the time. A 
For himself, his ambition was to rise up as quickly as possible. His idea of the war was, we are fighting communism. And if we don't stop it here in South Vietnam, it's going to come to Malaysia and Indonesia and Honolulu and San Francisco. That sounds crazy today, but almost everybody in the US government believed it in 1963. <clears throat> and his letters are really interesting because he's writing to his first wife, who's back in the US, and saying all that he's seeing that I described, the, the atrocities, the misuse of, power, of air power, the reports that lied, and yet he says, we have to be here. So he didn't question that. It took him four years to finally say, we can't do it, and we should never have tried, and we have to find a way out, and the only way out is by talking to the enemy. And that became a lifelong uh, belief. We have to talk to the enemy. And at the end of his life, he was trying to talk to the Taliban in Afghanistan, something Obama really didn't want to do, and Hillary Clinton didn't want to do. Holbrook was trying to push that, and it was at the very end when, he, when his aorta burst that he was telling Hillary Clinton about the first meetings with the Taliban. That was the end of his life. So <clears throat> he, Vietnam did not tell him we're, we're a force for destruction and we should actually pull back and get out of other people's business. That was the effect it had on a lot of other people in America, not on him. He remained a creature of that post-war period who thought if we're not there in some way, bad things will happen, not good. And they'll eventually come back to become our problem. So Vietnam didn't shake that loose. He remained a believer in American power, not military power. He was very skeptical of because David of Petraeus or William Westmoreland, but American power and influence in all forms. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you, you do make it very clear in the book that Vietnam marked his life and marked the way he thought about diplomacy and about military power. He was, by the way, uh, <coughs> I, don't, I don't think that's a spoiler, um, he was one of the authors of the Pentagon Papers. Yes. He was. He wrote a brilliant chapter about counterinsurgency. Um, and by then, he had come to the view, it took four years, that the war was unwinnable. But what's more interesting than that view is how he got to it, because he had to go through stages. And that tells you something about what it means to be inside government, responsible for a policy, working on the most important issue of your time, this war in Vietnam, and really unable to completely back out and reject it. Because to do so would be both the end of his personal ambition, he would have had to quit. He could have quit, he did not quit. But also maybe a psychological step that you can't take mm -hmm. if you're part of this, the structure. He doubted the reports. From there he doubted the tactics. From there he doubted the strategy of of sending a half a million troops. But it only was when he went back to the United States after three years in Vietnam and saw what the war was doing at home, tearing the country apart, that he knew we'll never be in Vietnam long enough to defeat this enemy if we can do it at all because the American people won't allow it. And that was when he said, we must negotiate. He had this great, he wrote a memo at age 26. This is the kind of thing that you find out when you have someone's papers. <clears throat> he wrote it to Lyndon Johnson. He's 26 years old. And it's basically an argument for negotiation with the North Vietnamese, which was really still taboo. And in it, he said, Hanoi uses time the way the Russians used terrain with Napoleon, always retreating, losing every battle, but so prolonging the lines, the war, that the invader would lose the will to continue the fight. That's almost poetry. And that's like a US government document that was sitting in some archive. And it's very intelligent. It's very smart. Because he was very smart. He was smart as hell. He was about the smartest person I've ever met. 
And those experiences, the, uh, the lessons he learned in Vietnam, the, 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 the limitations of military power and uh, um, the ramifications at home, which, which also limits what, what America can do, can do abroad. In, in how much were those <coughs> wider lessons that were learned by, by, by America? Because uh, the, first, of course, we had Gerald Ford, but in the end, it, it led to Jimmy Carter, with a foreign policy that was very much aimed at, at human rights, and which, in which Richard Holbrooke was uh, the youngest uh, assistant secretary of state uh, ever. So yeah. it, it, it seems that, it, that this lesson was, was learned wider. Or... To some extent, you're right. And Holbrooke wrote some of Carter's speeches on human rights. But as assistant secretary for East Asia at the young age of 35, Holbrook was trying to sell fighter jets to Suharto in Indonesia. He was making excuses for Marcos in the Philippines. He was quiet about the massacre at Kwangju by the South Korean military in 1980. He was willing to let human rights take second place to national interest because he fundamentally believed that America had to restore its influence in the Pacific after Vietnam. And the only way to do that was to shore up our partners in the region. At the same time, he was the first American official to denounce the Khmer Rouge. The Carter administration had no interest in Cambodia or Vietnam. We wanted to forget that region after the war. Holbrooke testified to Congress that what was happening in Cambodia was something like a genocide. And when the refugees began to pour out of Cambodia into Thailand, and when the boat people began to take to the South China Sea in flimsy vessels, Holbrook was telling Jimmy Carter, we have to be there. We have to save these people because we're partly responsible. So it's a mix. You, as a government official, he was carrying out the national interest, which looked pretty bad for human rights in a lot of cases. And as a human being, he cared about refugees and, and moved the government to take, to take a stand. All of that changed with the end of the Cold War. And suddenly, national interest was no longer a matter of supporting anti-communist dictators in Central America or in Asia. It was something new. It was expanding democracy. That was the Clinton doctrine, if there was one. And so it unleashed Holbrook to be the most liberal imperialist of them all, to use American power in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of places, most famously in Bosnia, but also in East Timor and in um, negotiating, uh, attempting to negotiate an end to the war in Congo and everywhere. He just suddenly thought the Russians are out of it, the Chinese are not yet in it, we're alone, we can do it, and we can do it without betraying our values. So for that brief decade, it looked as if everything had come into alignment. But I think that was not the beginning of something, it was the end. That was, that was the end of, of uh, the peak of our power. Yeah, so in, in fact, it was, it was the, the geopolitical situation of the 90s, after, after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that allowed for Richard Holbrooke to... Um, to uh, follow his, his better instincts. I think so. More idealistic instincts. He became a humanitarian interventionist. He became like the leading humanitarian interventionist in government. <clears throat> but that then led to him supporting the Iraq war, which he did <coughs> out of government. He was no longer in, because he was never serving under Republicans. He made a very cold political calculation that if he wanted to be Secretary of State, which he sure as hell wanted to be, he had to be for the Iraq War. And there's a scene in the book where he tells John Kerry... There's the ambition again. Yeah, the, the ego is never subdued. At times it's in alignment with the idealism, and at times they're out of whack, and the ego causes him to betray himself. So John Kerry came to his apartment one night, in 2002 in Manhattan, and Holbrook said, if you're running for president, you have to be for the war. And Holbrook 
could have added, and if I'm running for Secretary of State, I have to be for the war. So he was, he testified to the Senate in favor of it, and then spent the next five years trying to run away from it and turning his focus on Afghanistan, which he considered the real war that we needed to, to be involved in. Yeah, and, and as, as you describe very clearly in the book, this, this uh, lack of understanding or uh, liking each other between him and Obama, well, especially Obama not liking him, was, was one reason for uh, his failure in Afghanistan, because he never got through to the president and his ideas and his, his, his plea for uh, talks with the Taliban never really got through to, to right. the president. But right. wasn't it also uh, more, wasn't it maybe a foreshadowing of this end of an era um, in that sense that I, I remember that not very long ago there was an interview with uh, Admiral Mullen, Obama's chief of staff, uh, He's about the chairman of the military. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah that's what I mean. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, uh, about uh, the sudden withdrawal from northern Syria, Trump's sudden withdrawal from northern Syria, in which in which Mullen said, "Well, of course, this is, this is a very extreme move, but it's in line with the policy that." Obama started in, in, in Syria. So, True. sorry for the long question. True. What I mean to ask is, was there, was there more of a substance to, to the disconnect between Obama and Holbrooke than, than just character? Yes. It was character. It was generation. Holbrooke was a, a child of World War II and the post-war. Obama was a child of the Vietnam War. Um, and it was also worldview. Obama saw himself as the first president who could see America through the eyes of foreigners, saw us as one among many who needed to stop thinking of ourselves as exceptional and instead to join the world. And he also saw himself, I think, he never said this, as someone in, in a role to manage our decline. He accepted that we had lost at least relative power since the 90s, especially because of Iraq. The way Gorbachev was in the 80s. Exactly. A very good analogy. And his job was to gracefully manage it so that it didn't become a rout and we didn't lose everything, but we were more careful and hesitant about where we would engage. And Holbrook didn't think that way. On the other hand, and this is where foreign policy makes no sense, on Afghanistan, Obama was the one who sent 100,000 troops in the surge, or he sent 60,000 and there were already 40,000. Holbrook privately said the surge can never succeed because I've seen this movie in Vietnam. We cannot win this war with firepower. We have to talk to this in the insurgents because they have a base both in the country and across the border in Pakistan, the way the North Vietnamese had a base in Cambodia. So that was his overarching impulse to talk. And Obama had just sent in all these troops. He wasn't in a position to say, now we're going to start talking. Holbrooke never got the chance to say this to Obama, number one, because he didn't have the standing with the White House to actually say the surge cannot work, and number two, because Obama didn't want to be in the same room with him. And on the last morning of Holbrooke's life, before that tragic meeting with Hillary Clinton, he was at the White House with David Axelrod, Obama's advisor, asking for that meeting. And, and Axelrod basically said no, and that was when Holbrooke knew he would never get to meet with the president. He would not get to make his case for why we should begin talks now. So Obama, maybe because his generals had him cornered, maybe because he was young and inexperienced, he allowed himself to become the more militaristic of the two, and Holbrook was the one who wanted to negotiate. It's kind of a reversal of what you were saying, but it shows you that <clears throat> there is no consistency because events are always ahead of us and we're trying to catch up with them and figure out how to make our preconceived ideas fit with the reality in the world, which we don't understand, how could it make sense? We're just barely able to patch together a coherent strategy. 
okay, there's no consistency, but there, there is chronology. So how is uh, Donald Trump a consequence of this whole development? I think Mullen is right that <coughs> in, although Trump is in every way the opposite of Obama and has very deliberately tried to destroy every achievement of Obama from the Iran deal to health care. Seems to be his uh, main it, object. It, yeah. And if we're to believe the Steele dossier, he's willing to go pretty far in, let's say, pissing on Obama's legacy. But that's all nonsense. But you know that's that. all absolutely unbelievable. Um, at the same time, there is a continuity in that Obama was trying for a managed disengagement from the Middle East, and Trump, in his heedless, reckless way, just pulled the whole plug. At a moment when we'd actually found, the, for the first time, I would say, since 9-11, a successful formula. That was very few American troops, just enough to provide logistical uh, and intelligence and air support to a reliable ground partner, the Kurdish militia, which kept Assad out of northeastern Syria, <clears throat> kept Turkey across the border, kept Iran and Russia from filling a vacuum, and destroyed ISIS. What's not to like about that scenario, except that for Trump, it didn't matter because he didn't care about any of that. In fact, he seems to have a, a kind of affection for people like Putin and Erdogan. So let's pull him out and damn the Kurds. I think for Holbrook, that would have been absolutely intolerable. <clears throat> but you also said that there, there is an American landscape that, that uh, Donald Trump understands. Um, <clears throat> how much of that landscape agrees with him with this impulse of, what do we care? We're not there for us, so, I mean, we're staying for the oil, but... I mean, how long was the outrage about the betrayal of the Kurds a story? <clears throat> Maybe a I week? I don't know, you were in the States. No, a week, a I week. could tell you, and then another story took its place, and now no one really remembers the Kurds. It, it was kind of more of an elite concern among policymakers, journalists, people who actually are very focused on foreign affairs. I think for the public it was, it was an embarrassment, it was a shame for a lot of military people, it was a stain on their honor because we abandon our, our battlefield partner. But honestly, Trump speaks for a lot of Americans and the proof of that is look at his opponents in the Democratic Party. What are they saying about foreign policy? Nothing. It's completely missing from the campaign and the debates. So it's clear that they are not being pressured by voters in their events to talk about America coming back to a role in the world that at least begins to repair the damage. I think it doesn't mean Americans want us to withdraw from NATO or it's, it's not that much of a coherent idea. It's an impulse, a mood, which is weariness and a certain amount of bitterness at the failures of the last 15 or 20 years and a recognition that our own democracy is now sick. It's deeply sick. And how can we really lead as an example if, if we're so unhealthy at home? <clears throat>